after the youth and gender. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. No, I'm going to do it before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Folks, we're just waiting to, for 7 o'clock to start. <laughs> There's no mystery. We're just waiting. Just we got one more minute. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order uh, for Monday, March the 5th, 2018 at 7 o'clock p.m. I certainly want to welcome all of you all who are in attendance here today. We're so glad to see you, to see such a wonderful group of young people, especially with us tonight. Uh, I would uh, now like to ask you to please pause with me for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. I'm going to uh, now ask Council Member Reese uh, to uh, preside at the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, we are very fortunate to have two great groups of scouts to come up to the front and help us with the pledge tonight. So if Girl Scout Troop 998 would step on up. And Cub Scout Troop 424, if you guys would make your ways to the to the front of the chamber here. <coughs> uh, and sorry, there's more troops. That's the only. No I'm sorry, that's the only girls. That's the only troop number they gave us. All of the Girl Scouts just come on one. A troop 21 as well. And all the other Girl Scouts I missed. I apologize. <laughs> Bad work on my part. You should have seen the looks on their face. Everyone else did great. I was the failure there. I'm sorry. While they make their way up to the front, uh, I'll ask everyone else if it's your custom to do so. And if you're so able, please rise and join us for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Reese and company. <laughs> Uh, let me just say to the scouts and parents and scout masters that we are so glad to have you here tonight. We know that you may not want to stay for our entire meeting, <laughs> and you won't hurt anyone's feelings when you leave, uh, if you le whenever you leave. So just want to let you know that. But we're super glad to have the both the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts here tonight. It's great. And I want to shout out to my friend Kim Cameron for helping to lead. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Middleton. Here. And Councilmember Reese. 
I'm here, but embarrassed. <laughs> Get over it. All right. Sorry, everybody. I'm here, too. <laughs> Councilmember Freeman. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay, and now we're going to uh, move to our ceremonial items. And the first uh, proclamation that we have is the Girl Scout Week proclamation. And I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Deidreana Freeman if she would uh, do the honors tonight. And uh, there may be, there, I'm not sure if whom you all have designated to come and receive this. Uh, Kim, you and some of the scouts, uh, but y'all come on up and join Council Member Freeman over here at this microphone. We're presenting a proclamation for the Girl Scouts and for Girl Scout Week. Whereas March 12th marks the 106th anniversary of Girl Scouts of the United of USA, found by, founded by Juliet Gordon Lowe in 1912 in Savannah, Georgia. And whereas throughout its distinguished history, Girl, Scout, Girl Scouting has inspired millions of girls and women with the highest of ideals of, of courage, confidence, and character. And whereas through the Girl Scout leadership experience, girls gain knowledge and develop skills that's, that will serve them a lifetime so that they may contribute to their communities. Girl Whereas Girl Scouting takes an active role in increasing girls' awareness of the opportunities available to them today in science, technology, engineering, math, and the arts, as well as other fields that can expand their horizons. And whereas Girl Scouts have shaped the lives of 53% of female senior executives and business owners, 60% of women in Congress, and virtually every female astronaut, and whereas more than 2.7 million current Girl Scout members nationwide will be celebrating 106 years of this American tradition with nearly 50 million women who are former Girl Scouts, including myself, and living proof of the impact of this amazing movement. And whereas in partnership with over 9,000 adult volunteers, Girl Scouts North Carolina Coastal Pines serves nearly 26,000 girl members in 41 central and eastern North Carolina counties, including 2,265 of the adult and girl members in the city of Durham. Now, therefore, I, Steve M. Schull, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of March 6th through the 12th, 2018, as Girl Scout Week in Durham and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance and applaud the commitment of Girl Scouting has made to support the life and leadership development of girls. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this fifth day of March, 2018. And Kim Cameron is going to actually make some remarks. Thank you, Mayor Shul, um, Council Member Freeman, and other city council members, and everyone in the audience. Girl Scouts builds girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. Each year, Girl Scouts North Carolina Coastal Pines serves over 26,000 girls in 41 counties in Central and Eastern North Carolina. Girl Scouts serve 11% of the Girl Scout population in Durham over, with over 2,000 total girls in Girl Scouts and over 718 adult volunteers. Girl Scouts are the preeminent leadership development organization for girls. And with programs from coast to coast and across the globe, <coughs> Girl Scouts offer girls a chance to practice a lifetime of leadership, adventure, and success. Studies have shown that during the first 20 years of life, 
that a girl experiences, a girl only experiences, sorry, deeply affect the development of young women's confidence and the trajectory of the rest of their lives. We firmly, excuse me, believe in the power of girl. G, go-getter, I, innovator, R, risk taker, and L, leader to change the world. Thank you. Kim, would you like Councilmember Freeman and the girls to pose here in the front for a photograph or two? Well, how about the council members? Other, any, have any other council members been Girl Scouts? Uh, Go, for yes. Go for it, Girl right. Scouts. <laughs> I was not a Girl Scout, so I'll just take a picture. <laughs> Perfectly fine. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Girls, maybe you'll uh... Thank you so much. Maybe you'll become an astronaut or maybe you'll become a city council member or mayor of Durham. Thank you. President. <laughs> wow. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So now we're on to our second ceremonial item which is Women's History Month proclamation. And I'm going to uh, ask Della Mattioli if she would join me. And anyone else that you would like to bring with you, Ms. Mattioli. Good to see you. We have a proclamation here uh, about uh, women's history. Whereas women have played a unique role throughout the history of the city of Durham and Durham County, North Carolina, and the nation in many ways, and whereas women have persevered in overcoming challenges and fought for what they believe in, and whereas women have been leaders not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in governance, medicine, mental health, social justice, business, and fashion and beauty, and other movements which create a more fair and just society for all. Whereas too often women are unsung and sometimes their contributions go unnoticed with many history books focusing primarily on political, military, and economic leaders and events. However, the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women who helped build America is as vital as that of the men whose names we know so well. And whereas, looking over the past 150 years since Confederation, countless women have harnessed their energy and talents, found their voice, and claimed their place in our country's proud history, and younger generations of women will carry the torch and continue to contribute to Durham County, North Carolina, in this nation. Now, now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2018 as Women's History Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance, as well as libraries, schools, and community organizations to focus on the leaders who struggled for equality, like Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Lucy Stone, and many more, as we raise our awareness about the generations of women who have, who are, and who will shape and influence the history of Durham, North Carolina, and the world. Witness my hand, the corporate seal of the city of North Durham, North Carolina, this fifth day of March, 2018. And uh, I'm going to now turn this over to Del Mattioli for some, for some remarks. Thank you, Mayor Schull. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the mayor and city council as well, and all of you for having the history of knowing about women. And I applaud these beautiful girls I was a Girl Scout, and it is the right thing for you to continue. Okay, Women's History Month is very important, and it started in 1980 when 
Jimmy Carter put that together. So since then, I have been trying to elevate us because I realize that mostly everything that we're involved with, a woman is somewhere. And to get it done, choose some women and it gets done. So I'm applauding the city of Durham for recognizing how valuable all of us women are and we definitely support our men. Thank you very much and have a beautiful, beautiful year. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. And now for the final uh, ceremonial item of tonight, we have a special recognition. And I'm going to call on my former council colleague, Eddie Davis, uh, to make this presentation. Uh, you may know that in my uh, State of the City address, I uh, named Eddie to be our first public historian in Durham. And I'm very excited that as we kick off the Begin, the, as Eddie says, the parade towards our sesquicentennial that he has chosen to recognize a very special person uh, in Durham's history for uh, our first recognition. So, Councilmember Davis, please come with your special honoree, and you can do the honors. Well, thank you so much, Mayor Shul. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to have the parade marshal to be recognized here. Uh, I'll read it as we have it here, um, and honoring Jean Bradley Anderson. Whereas the, city, the Durham City Council is engaged in a 13-month prelude to the 150th anniversary of the official incorporation of the city of Durham, and uh, whereas the book Durham County the History of Durham County, North Carolina by Jean Bradley Anderson is viewed by scholars as the most definitive and the most comprehensive written history of the city and the county of Durham. And whereas Jean Bradley Anderson, a Phi Beta Kappa a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, moved to Durham in 1955 with her husband, Dr. Carl L. Anderson, and whereas Jean Bradley Anderson, Margaret Nygaard, and several other advocates of nature preservation took an early interest in the protection of the scenic beauty and the wildlife habitat of the Eno River. And whereas Jean Bradley Anderson has written several books that feature the multi-ethnic lives, the bustling times, the memorable characters, and the evolving development of Durham from the Eno and Ankanichi Native Americans of the 1700s to the diverse and cosmopolitan nature of our 21st century city. And whereas Jean Bradley Anderson provided pivotal research for the five volume history of our state called The Way We Lived in North Carolina, which was produced by the State Department of Archives and History. And whereas Jean Bradley Anderson holds the distinction of having taught at Duke University, at North Carolina Central University, and at Durham Technical Community College. And whereas Jean Bradley Anderson has been involved with many historical, genealogical, artistic, and preservation groups in Durham and beyond, and whereas Jean Bradley Anderson has been presented with numerous honors, including induction into the North Carolina <coughs> Society, and the receipt of the Bartlett Durham Award from Preservation Durham, and whereas Jean Bradley Anderson was one of the numerical contributors to the book, 27 Views of Durham, The Bull City in Prose and Poetry. Uh, Steve Shule, some of you may know him, uh, wrote the introduction to this collection. Now, therefore, and I'm reading it as it is here, I, Stephen M. Shule, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, and the Durham City Council salute Jean Bradley Anderson and wishes to begin the 13-month parade of sesquicentennial programs, events, activities by thanking Mrs. Anderson for her comprehensive work as a historical ambassador for the city and county of Durham, North Carolina. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this the fifth day of March, 2018, and is signed by Steve Shule, our mayor. It is presented to you.
I'm speechless after that. Um, I'm very grateful to the mayor, Mr. Shule, the members of the council, and to Mr. Davis especially for this honor. I've been in Durham a long time. As he said, I came in 1959. And during that time, I've had a lot of things to do and a lot of people to meet. When we first came, my husband and I and my son, um, I was struck with how kind everyone was. I was from Philadelphia. And in the North, we didn't have such very nice manners. And we weren't so warm and hospitable. But right away, we began to feel very much at home. And uh, I had an intense history, uh, interest in history right from the start, because I had never lived in the South before. But I had always wanted to. And during all that time, I have met many wonderful people here and many of their ancestors, too, because most of my time was spent in the archives or the libraries researching the past. I'm delighted that you're going to be celebrating the history for the next 12 months. And I look forward to those events. I think it's so important for everyone to know the history of the place we live. It will add immensely to our understanding and our enjoyment of every day. Um, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to write the history and it's very gratifying to know that it has proved useful. Thank you again for this honor. I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, the son I spoke of is here. <laughs> and my daughter, who was the only native Durhamite in our family, <laughs> is here, and my good friend who lives at the Forest of Duke and has been a very loyal help to me, and two of my grandsons, one the daughter of my son, Carl Anderson, and the other the daughter of my daughter, I mean the son of my daughter, <laughs> uh, Alexander Justanus. I'm so glad they were able to come from quite a distance, one from Germany, to be with me wow. tonight. Fantastic. Thank you. Congratulations. Well deserved. I remember you so well from that 27 meetings of Durham. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That was fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Thank you, Mr. Oh, thank Davis. you so much. Let me walk down with you. Oh, thank uh, you. At, be, before we go, uh, we'd like to make sure that the members of the council, the manager, the attorney, and the clerk all have copies of Mrs. Anderson's book, uh, courtesy of the Duke University Press. Thank you so much. Ms. Anderson, thank you for gracing us tonight. And Council Member Davis, thank you so much for initiating our parade towards our sesquicentennial celebration in April of 2019. Thank you so much. And thanks to the family for being here. We appreciate it. I did take a course with Carl Anderson many years ago and enjoyed it quite a lot. So, All right. Uh, I believe we are now uh, down to announcements by the council. Uh, are there any announcements by members of the council? Mr. Mayor, I have one. Yes, sir. Council Member Middleton. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, fellow council members, hello, friends in the chamber. Uh, Mr. Mayor, in addition to being a uh, proud brand ambassador for the city, one of the things I'm proud of uh, is being a Durham's official representative to the National League of Cities, a uh, National Municipal, uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities. Um, this week, the National League of Cities will be holding their Congressional City Conference uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, my announcement is that this will be my first official trip uh, since election. Um, I think it's important because many people consider uh, Durham an oasis in the midst of our state, 
and see us as a bastion of progressivism. Uh, but our continued way of life will only uh, be able to exist if we foster uh, strong working relationships in Raleigh and in D.C., notwithstanding uh, partisan uh, affiliation. So while in D.C., I plan on caucusing with our uh, legislative representatives there to talk about light rail funding, RDU funding, and something else I plan on bringing up is the concealed carry reciprocity law, which is on the horizon, um, which, of course, we're, we're very concerned about gun violence here in Durham. I say all this to say that in addition to us as council members talking to legislators, I just want to ask citizens uh, to stay engaged, not just sending us letters and emails, but to contact Raleigh and contact DC as well, uh, and let your voices be heard in addition to our voices being heard uh, in those halls uh, in order to preserve the way of life we have uh, here in Durham. So I'm looking forward to that trip, and I look forward to reporting back uh, when I get back. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Are there any other announcements, council members? All right. Uh, now we will move to the uh, uh, the business uh, first order of business. Are there any priority items uh, by the city manager? Uh, thank you, Mayor Shule. Members of the council, good evening. No priority items. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. No items. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, now we will move to the consent agenda. Uh, the all items on the consent agenda may be approved by a single vote of the council um, unless an item is removed by a council member or the member of the public for separate consideration at the end of the meeting tonight. So I'm going to now read the consent agenda items. Uh, item one, Mayor's Council for Women appointments. Let me just say uh, before we go on that after these appointments are approved, we will uh, uh, have uh, the swearing in of these uh, of, these, of the members of this council. Item one, Mayor's Council for Women Appointments. Item two, Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission Appointment. Item three, Citizens Advisory Committee Appointment. Item four, Selection of the External Auditor. Item five, 2017 Municipal Primary and Municipal General Elections. Item six, Woodcroft Parkway Extension Municipal Agreement, U5823. Item seven, Replacement Radio Systems for Transit Vehicles. Item eight, replacement of light transit vehicles. Item nine, Central Park Waterline Replacement Project Amendment two. Item 10, West Main Street and North Elizabeth Street Waterline Replacements Contract for Professional Engineering Services. Item 11, Electric Service Agreement with Duke Energy Carolinas LLC for a North Durham Water Reclamation Facility. Item 12, the bid report for January 2018. Item 13, lease of Cleveland Street parking lot for City of Durham employee parking. Item 14, Durham Sustainability Roadmap Adoption. Item 15, Second Amendment to Asset Management Contract. Item 16, Telecommunications License Agreement with South Carolina Telecommunications Group, LLC, DBA, Spirit Communications. I have a quick question on 16. All righty. We will pull item 16 from the consent agenda, and we will hear it after the public hearings. Thank you. Item 17, Utility Extension Agreement with 512 Gordon Street, LLC, to serve the Gordon Street Towns Project. Item 19 to 21, these items can be found on the general business agenda under public hearings. With the exception of item 16, this one with the exception of item 16, could I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, can you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7 0. Great. Thank you very much. Now, normally at this time, we would move into our public hearings, but we are going to have a, a special uh, ceremony now for those members of the, of the Mayor's Women's Commission, our first members of our, our inaugural group of our Mayor's Women's Commission members, Mayor's Council, I'm sorry, Mayor's Council for Women. And I'm going to call their names. Not all of them are here tonight, but for those who are here, uh, could you please come up to this microphone over here, and uh, the city clerk will uh, swear you into office. Nana Asante Smith, Nida Alam, Ashley Kennedy, Gloria De Los Santos, Mina Ezikpe, Megan McCurley, Dolly Reeves, Amy Koch, and Rebecca Miel. And it looks like several of them are here. And our clerk will now do
do the honors. Diana. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are we ready? Okay. I state your name. Do you hereby solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, and that I will faithfully and impartially Discharge the duties of my office as a member of the Mayor's Council for Women. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you very much to our city clerk. And thank you all for all those members who were able to be here tonight. Let me just say quickly to the Mayor's Council on Women, uh, we will soon be convening you. Uh, myself and Mayor Pro Tem Jillian Johnson will be getting together you, with you all for your first meeting, and that will be soon. We're looking forward to it. Do you have any comments on that, Ms. Johnson? I'm really excited to get started. It, okay. I, I, Deidre Ann and I were just saying it feels significant that we're here um, with a proclamation for the Girl Scouts and a proclamation for um, women's history and um, swearing in our women's council. So we're really excited. Perfect it's a good, timing. it is, it's a, it's a great night. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. We had 28 applicants. We had a very hard job. We chose nine members. We had 28 applicants, and that was very difficult to do, but we have some fantastic members of this council. Now I'm going to move on to our public hearing items. And I'm going to begin with item 19, the consolidated <clears throat> annexation for 5220 Wake Forest Highway. We're having a we're having a photography pause. <laughs> Miss Miss Sunyak, come on up and get us started. Thanks. Good evening. First off, all items listed uh, before you tonight have been properly noticed in accordance with statute, and the affidavits are on file with the planning staff. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. I am Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. Thank you. Uh, first case is the consolidated annexation for 5220 Wake Forest Highway. <clears throat> Request for utility extension agreement. Voluntary annexation, plan, amendment, and zoning map change have been received from Eastwood Homes of Raleigh LLC for one parcel totaling 14.919 acres. The subject site is located at 5220 Wake Forest Highway. This annexation petition, which is case BDG 17 seeks to bring the parcel into the existing city limits. The subject site is presently zoned rural residential. The applicant is requesting a zoning designation of plan development residential 5.362 and has committed to a maximum of 79 townhouse residential units. The parcel is currently um, designated as low density residential four dwelling units per acre and the applicant has requested an amendment to low medium density residential which is four to eight dwelling units per acre, which would be consistent with the zone change. <clears throat> Approval of the annexation petition, plan amendment, and zoning would be, be become effective on March 31st, 2018. Key commitments on the development plan associated with this request include specifically townhouse units, uh, a 50-foot building setback, and additional tree coverage along the southern property 
line. Increased project boundary buffers abutting PID 166180, which is one of the properties to the west. Um, at least 51% of the units will have only single bay garages and additional asphalt for a future bicycle lane. The public works and water management departments have determined that the existing water and sewer mains have the capacity for the proposed development. The budget and management services department have determined that the proposed annexation will become revenue positive immediately following the annexation. Additional information can be found in the staff report. The Durham Planning Commission at their November 14th, 2017 meeting recommended approval of the FLOM designation and the plan development residential district by a vote of eight to four. <clears throat> Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies and ordinances. <clears throat> four motions are required for this application. The first is required by law to approve the utility extension agreement and the voluntary annexation petition. The second is adoption of a, of a resolution amending the FLOM designation. The third is to adopt a consistency statement, and the fourth is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've heard the report of staff, and now I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And I'm first going to ask if there are questions or comments by members of the council. All right. Any questions or comments at this point by members of the council? Um, Okay, we have two people who have signed up to speak on this item, Tim Sivers, and there's uh, someone who said they're an opponent but did not sign their name, unfortunately. So let me just ask uh, those people who would like to speak, if you would raise your hand just to make sure that we have everyone. Okay, so Tim and sir, would you... Um, would you mind coming over here and fill out another card and put your name on it? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sivers, uh, you are a proponent of this, and I believe this gentleman is an opponent. Uh, and so I'm going to give you five minutes. Okay. And uh, if you don't need to use it all, you can reserve it uh, for any other comments you might like to make. Okay, thank you, sir. So, thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Thank you for your time, members of the staff, and I appreciate your work as well as the uh, meeting with the uh, council members over the last few weeks. Uh, the request in front of you tonight is for a future land use map, rezoning, and annexation of this parcel. The neighborhood meeting was held on May, and approximately 25 members were in attendance. Since then, I've provided email updates, as well as recently this past week, reaching out to some of the adjacent property owners on the cul-de-sac to make sure they were informed about the, uh, <coughs> inter the road interconnection that would be provided if this project is approved. The future land use map is a change. Currently, it is uh, less than four units per acre, and we're requesting a change to uh, medium, low medium density, which is four to eight units per acre. Our development plan will limit this to 5.3 units per acre, which is on the lower end of that four to eight unit range. We'll provide a transition between the existing commercial and low density residential. It'll also prevent inappropriate expansion of the two commercial nodes to the east and to the west. The accommodating rezoning request is change RR to PDR 5.3. This will, this will complement the surrounding area nodes as well as the residential subdivision to the south. Our project includes commitments of 79 townhome residential units with building materials similar to the single family residential development we know as Ravenstone. We will construct NC 98 to a full three lane section between the commercial shopping center and Hillview Drive, including an, exist, an exclusive westbound left turn lane at the site entrance and an eastbound right turn lane at the site entrance. Provide additional asphalt for bike lane tree coverage, boundary buffers, and a maximum of 50% impervious area coverage. During the planning commission, we have agreed to provide additional setbacks as uh, Ms. Sunyak provided in her review. Um, while meeting with some of the neighbors, 
uh, planning commission members and members of the council, a few concerns were brought to our attention that I would like to review. Uh, traffic, the road improvements committed tonight uh, and on our development plan provide reasonably expected, uh, will help mitigate the reasonably expected traffic for a 79 townhome unit subdivision. The interconnection of the adjacent development will allow multiple points of access for this project. NCDOT and the City of Durham are working together on the NC98 corridor project, which you all know will provide improvements from Durham to Wake Forest. And in addition, a signal is proposed just to the east at Olive Branch and NC98 intersection, which will help slow traffic along the front of this property. Stormwater. The project area currently does not contain any stormwater measures allowing the runoff to flow onto the adjacent properties without treatment. The, an irrigation pond, an existing irrigation pond, was removed by the homeowner and provided absolutely no treatment to the stormwater. Our project will provide treatment and necessary erosion and stormwater controls at the, as the city st city's stormwater controls measurements have become increasingly stringent over the last few years. This development has stormwater devices that potentially make things better for the downstream residents. Tree coverage, natural areas, and open space. The developer and I are very aware of the need to connect open space and natural areas of existing trees. To accommodate, to accommodate this, we would like to add a commitment tonight to provide a 25-foot natural area along the southern boundary line. That will be in the same location as the 50-foot building setback. The natural area will provide existing trees to remain undisturbed along the existing single family houses and provide a connection of the existing open space area within the Ravenstone subdivision. In addition, we'd like to commit to providing a minimum of 15% tree save. This will allow existing trees to remain as well as plant new material for the future. The offsite sidewalk connection on NC 98. After the planning commission meeting and the suggestion to provide this connection, the developer and I have agreed to provide this connection and agree that it will be as needed for the connection to the Ravenstone Shopping Center. The recently approved site plan for Goodwill Community Foundation will construct about half of the sidewalk between our site and the Ravenstone Shopping Center. We agreed to provide the remaining portion, which is approximately 300 feet, uh, 300, approximately 305 feet. Uh, however, this, this location is in the county um, and we've been working with the county of a planning department to currently come up with some information about how and who will provide maintenance and liability for this location. And I know there'll be questions on that in a few minutes. Uh, the school system. We would like to provide an additional proffer tonight for a 500. Mr. Sivers, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let you finish that proffer and then I'm going to uh, ask uh, our next speaker to come and, and uh, then we'll see if we have questions for you. Okay, I have two additional proffers. Go ahead, you can say that. Under a minute. If we uh, need to give more time to the opponents, we'll do so. Thank you. Uh, school, the school system, we'd like to provide an additional proffer tonight for a $500 contribution to the Durham Public School Systems for each additional student added by this development. And the second proffer I'd like to add, of course, is affordable housing. It's been a very hot topic and I did have some additional comments, but I'll sum it up in saying the developer and I are aware of this need and we would like to provide an $8,000 one-time donation to the affordable housing, um, I think it's affordable housing fund or work with a local developer, for example, CASA, um, that can provide affordable housing here in Durham. Thank you, if I have any questions, I'm available. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be questions, but I'm now going to uh, ask Mr. Jonathan Talley if he would like to speak. As Mr. Talley is coming forward, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Thank you. Mr. Talley, you have five minutes. You don't have to take it all at once if you would like to uh, save some of it. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, good, good evening, Mayor and uh, City Council. Sir, could you state your name and address? Uh, Jonathan Talley, 220 Hillview Drive, Durham. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm not going to take up very much of your time. Um, I was able to send a, a correspondence to you all with some uh, topics that I was uh, felt pretty strongly about, and I'll just summarize a few of those, and um, maybe some of the time later, if you'd like to address those, that'd be fine. Um, the development in general, um, I didn't find was, um, well, let, me, let me start over. I've been involved with um, this development and 
the um, public hearings that they've had with the members of our community uh, from the beginning and uh, throughout the time. Um, we've had a lot of questions and, and concerns about many of these topics. Um, these are some of mine. Uh, I didn't find that the uh, development was consistent with uh, our community um, or the comprehensive plan. Um, the low medium density housing um, zone uh, that was requested isn't uh, similar to any of the other communities around um, our community, our neighboring communities, the developments that are, that are popping up around us. Um, also, uh, one of the big topics was uh, the economics. Um, I remember early on, the developer mentioned that any smaller or any more rural residential zoning, lower density zoning, wouldn't be economic for the development. And that really hit many of us uh, in Ravenstone because we were involved in a uh, failed development um, fiasco a bit um, where developer was overstretched and they weren't able to uh, continue and finish our community. So um, economics and situations that involve such a tight budget concern a lot of folks. Um, you know, if the economy turns around or something like that, uh, we might find ourselves with another failed development just next door to us. Um, Many of the other items were revolved around transportation and the busy corridor that's Highway 98. It's already very busy in the morning and evening. Um, this would just be more uh, cars on the road and even adding things like a bike lane and pedestrian traffic next to that road. Um, I would love to walk to the grocery store at the corner, but I can't because of the traffic that's currently there now. And I don't know if I would feel safe on a, a sidewalk either. Um, we just finished our stormwater and street infrastructure recently in our community. And uh, many, many times um, have we had overflowing sewer grates and stormwater that flowed on that property onto our lots. So uh, just development, continuing that, doesn't seem like it's gonna be a, a, uh, a positive influence to that. Um, what I would like to see is affordable housing <coughs> in other locations. Uh, I don't think that um, due to the economics of this development and the location of it, there's, there's not really a good spot for affordable housing um, in this area. There's not easy public transportation to jobs. There's not a walking community where folks can live affordably and walk to work, take public transportation to work. Um, and the price point in this area, um, I don't think that um, that anyone could support that, unfortunately. I do feel like affordable housing is a very important topic and it should be considered in other areas of Durham to where that makes uh, viable sense. Um, and finally, the parks and recreation uh, in our area, um, we're in a parks and rec desert. Uh, if I want to take my family to a park, I have to drive to, to Wake County or, or Raleigh and go to a park with, with uh, friends of ours. There's, there's nowhere for my, my child to play uh, unless it's in our community. And uh, I, don't, I don't know this development, um, if they're gonna add a park, a small park for their residents or whatnot, but I would really love to see um, different types of development in our area and not more housing, but more services for uh, the residents. So that's all I have. Mr. Talley, thank you very much. You might want to stay up here for a minute, Mr. Talley. Just have a seat because uh, council members may have questions for you. Thank you. All right, uh, council members, uh, questions or comments at this point for the applicant or staff? Uh, council Member Freeman. So uh, the question would be for staff and recognizing the comment that Mr. Talley made about uh, the overflowing grates, uh, stormwater. Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Please uh, repeat that question for me, please. So specifically with the the area that this development would be going into or that's planned, how would we address this rural development shifting to more suburban and developing a plan that makes sure that those grates aren't overflowing any more than they currently are? 
So part of the uh, requirements of the stormwater uh, division include evaluating the existing conditions downstream. And as such, they look at both the quantity and quality of the development under city rules. And, and so I just, just making the, the note for the rest of council, so I voted against this on the planning commission specifically because I'm, I'm concerned about this area continuing to shift from rural to urban or urban uh, rural to suburban and heading into urban with the density that's pretty much developing and having a concern about the area being planned in a way that makes sure the traffic doesn't become an issue, that there is a safe way to, to grow so that developers can continue to develop. I, I feel comfortable voting for this development. I, I just wanna make sure that we're, we're preparing to, to, to come up with some um, intermediary uh, fixes for some of the stormwater conversations that keep arising. Do you have any more comments on that, Robert? Anything else on the stormwater? Uh, no, sir, but I will make sure that the stormwater team is fully informed of this matter and they will check into it. Thank you, Councilmember Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tim, just a, a couple of questions. I know you referenced the neighbors in the adjoining cul-de-sac. Correct. Um, could you just summarize what responses or uh, input came from those neighbors at all? during sure. this process? Um, uh, a week ago today, I sent a letter out to the, those four neighbors that are around that cul-de-sac and hadn't heard any responses. So actually yesterday I went and knocked on doors because I wanted to make sure they had the opportunity um, because their driveway will be impacted if this road is connected as the uh, public works would require that the cul-de-sac be removed. So I went and knocked on doors. Um, two of the four homeowners were at home when I had knocked yesterday afternoon and was able to speak with them. Uh, the two homeowners that were home are directly adjacent and they share a property line with this project. So those were the two, um, two of the had, out of the four, they had the more impact for this development. Um, I don't know the addresses, but the um, resident on the northern corner of the cul-de-sac uh, was, was an elderly lady and um, asked that her son give me a call. Unfortunately, he was not able to call me today. But they did say that they um, they had actually, I will quote her, think it's a good thing with the road connection. Um, she had was was actually hopeful that the uh, cul-de-sac would be removed and did have no problems with the development itself. Um, the gentleman on the southern portion that abuts our project as well, um, his main question was how many units is it going to be? Um, and uh, so I answered that as a maximum of 79, that would be townhome units. Uh, he as well had no major concerns um, with the road connection and had already understood that the right-of-way was previously extended um, past the cul-de-sac and that that's, that's how the city um, requires and provides for internal connection. So he knew that was there and when he bought his house understood that that could be a, thorough, could be a connection in the future. I appreciate that. One other question. Uh, you mentioned the five-foot natural area around the southern boundary line. Yes. Could you just explain what natural area means? You mean a tree line? What sure, sure. Mean? So on the, the back edge of this property that is on the southern edge um, adjacent to the Ravenstone subdivision, um, we this project boundary is adjacent to actually open space. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we want to connect to their open space. And what we'll do is we'll put tree protection fence up 25 feet off of our property line and it'll stay as it sits today. Natural, there, there is uh, existing vegetation in there, existing trees, um, mostly soft woods, but they are uh, 30 to 40 foot tall. Uh, it's not, um, but it's, it's also pretty thick in that area. So that'll help uh, not only provide the open space and tree coverage, but also provide a buffer to the uh, residential, residential parcels to the south in, that are, exist today in Ravenstone. Thank you. Sure. Mayor, did you have one more? Sure, of course. Council Member Freeman. Um, actually for Tim. Si Silver, I'm sorry. No problem. Cybers. Cybers, yes. Cybers. Uh, you mentioned the 8000 for the fund. That's How did you come up with that number? Uh, there was a couple calculations put into that number. Um, again, this is a, a smaller subdivision, 79 units, so we took that into effect with the amount of road improvements and uh, for this site for 79 lots is, uh, is quite a feat. Uh, so we took that calculation and worked in the uh, basin fees as well. 
and uh, the number is truly based off, it's approximately 100 units, or $100 per unit with our 79. That's where we came up with this number. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Okay, Council Member Middleton. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Talley, I wanted to ask you a couple questions, if you don't mind. First off, thank you, ma'am, for coming out. And, uh, we take um, our residents' input very, very seriously on this council. So I want to thank you for taking your time and coming to talk to us. I, I, I want to be clear, because I was listening to you very intently, is, is it your understanding that this is an affordable housing development or an attempt at affordable housing? Uh, no, sir. Um, it was my understanding that during the planning commission, there was a lot of talk of affordable housing, and um, there was a lot of back and forth with the developer about uh, what, what might be considered affordable housing, what type of homes were coming out of this community, and while there wasn't enough information available, there was a lot of, of talk back and forth. So uh, it's my understanding that this wasn't, but I'm also under the impression that there's not a clear definition for developers to, to be making affordable housing considerations for development. You also mentioned your concerns about traffic patterns. W would the proffers made by the developer uh, not address your concerns about traffic? Um, the talk about the widening the roads, would that not address it? So, um, the proffers were, were quick at the end there, so I didn't, I might not have catched them all, but I believe it was a bike lane, um, a widening of a turn lane or addition of a, of a center turn lane. And um, during one of, the, one of the meetings with some of the other residents of my community, we all talked about how, um, you know, those lanes were, were kind of classified as terrible name, but a suicide lane because of traffic and moving fast on both sides and people try to turn out of that lane and make a left turn in the community. Um, and honestly, during heavy congestion, it's it's a standstill. So anyone trying to make that turn is is kind of gunning their car. So I don't know if uh, making it safer w would be my um, agreement. And, and finally, let me ask you, just to be honest with you, as a policymaker, that that parcel is probably it's not going to stay blank forever, empty forever. Absolutely. So ideally, what what would what would you want to see go there if not this type of development? Um, my main concern about um, this type of development is the fact that it's not consistent with our development and developments around us. Um, it's a what do you mean by density. consistent? Um, the amount of homes per acre is it's a higher density um, development than our development. Um, so the more people per lot, the more infrastructure, the more traffic, um, and the less services to be divided up about, around those people. Okay. Thank you, sir. I have one question for the developer. Full disclosure, we talked very directly about the proffers uh, when you met with me in my office, and I appreciate the proffer to the um, Affordable Housing Fund. It, it, $8,000. If instead of giving us $8,000, you talked about working with a local developer, Correct. what would that look like? And you wouldn't cap that help at $8,000. I don't know. How would you quantify? Is it possible that we can get more out of you in <laughs> working with a developer than an $8,000 cash um. drop? So, so our we'd like to stick to the eight thousand dollars, but work. I think, sure. with, I, I think with working I, as a potentially a, an option to work with Casa as an example, or Habitat for Humanity, or there's there's other great um, institutions that do do affordable housing in the area. Uh, private development may go further for with that eight thousand dollars than public development way, um, but that's why we left it open to be a, a donation to the public as the city of Durham for the affordable housing fund or a private donation for CASA. So if you work for someone uh, with an organization like CASA or Habitat, you would you would quantify $8,000 worth of work with them in, in some form or fashion? Is it? Uh, I don't fully understand your question. So, well, so it's, a, it's an $8,000 donation. Right. But if, okay, so it's, is, is it either or, or if, if you don't give us $8,000 and you work with a, we say, instead of giving us $8,000, partner with a developer to do some type of affordable housing project. Do you have some type of internal equation by which you'll cap it at $8,000 working with the developer instead of giving, if, if you didn't give us the 8,000, us being the city? Uh, still don't follow your question, sir. So so the, the options that, that we've brought, and, and maybe Maybe this is the confusing part. We would like to we'd like to provide an eight thousand dollar donation. But I heard you Either also to, say or and right. correct me well, from or work with a local me, meaning meaning the donation would either go to the city uh, or to Casa. Ah, the donation. Or, okay, got well, it. it's an eight thousand dollar donation to 
somebody. I got you. Who an affordable you. housing developer, whether that's the city or a private fund. Got you, got you, got you. Thanks. So the 8,000 is static. I, I got that's you. correct. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you. Councilmember Caballero. I also have questions for the developer really quick. I know the answer to this question, but um, could you share the price point for the townhomes? Yeah, the price point uh, to start is approximately two hundred to 225000 Thank you. And then when you're talking about the turn lane, could you just share a little bit more about that just to, so I can have like a visual of what that is? I, full disclosure, I drove out to the site today so okay. I could see um, the impact on traffic and just how, because it seemed to be a big concern, so I wanted to experience it myself. Okay. Um, so I would just like uh, uh, more description on where it's placement, essentially. Okay. Uh, in front of the Ravenstone Shopping Center, which is the food line, there are turn lanes in there. As you approach the frontage of this site, it actually goes down to two lanes, which are both through lanes. And then back to the next intersection, which is where the future traffic light will be, it goes back to three lanes uh, with, a, with turn lanes. Uh, again, the front of our site is just two through lanes. So what we're going to do is that right at the front, we're actually going to double that. We're going to create four lanes. So there'll be a dedicated eastbound turn lane and a dedicated westbound turn lane. So anyone that is turning will not be sitting in traffic and, you know, they'll, they'll be out of the way of the through traffic. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Council members, any other questions or comments? I have a couple. Um, I also drove out there uh, and... Uh, just one question I have, uh, I guess I'd like to ask staff, uh, Mr. Judge, do you have comments that you'd like to make about the sufficiency of the proffers regarding traffic that uh, Mr. Cybers has uh, talked to us about? Yes, Bill Judge, Transportation. The, uh, the proffers related to the left and right turn lane construction to provide, as uh, Mr. Cybers indicated, um, our requirements of the city and NCDOT, so they are they are meeting those requirements as well as the uh, we requested the additional four foot of asphalt widening for the frontage of the site to provide for bicycle accommodations, and they provided that as well. And in your uh, estimation, are these requirements sufficient to handle the traffic that you believe that will be uh, uh, added to our roads through this uh, development? Yes, those uh, turn lanes are needed as Mr. Cybers indicated, in order to provide a safe location for vehicles entering the site to, to move out of the through lanes of traffic on NC-98. Thank you. Um, so um, I guess this is a question for planning. Mr. Cybers indicated that the developer would like to proffer the construction of 305 feet of sidewalk, but that that sidewalk is in the county and would require the county to maintain it, which the county does not typically do. So I'm wondering if staff has any comments on that. Yes, it, it was our understanding that there was an um, interest in constructing a sidewalk. Uh, full disclosure, planning staff has received calls from one of the neighbors who abuts the property, and uh, she wasn't necessarily opposed to having the sidewalk constructed there, but her concern was the um, liability and the maintenance of the sidewalk. Um, the applicant, um, as he mentioned earlier, has introduced a proffer for the construction of the sidewalk, but it is problematic um, for the reason stated. It's not located within, the property is not located within the city limits. So um, my, uh, there has been some back and forth between the planning staff and the applicant um, as late as a couple hours before, and there are a couple options um, that have been suggested. Um, and before the applicant mentions that, I just wanted to state for the record so we have good housekeeping, the applicant does need to come up and go through the entire list of proffers um, from the beginning so that we have a clear record of exactly what they are. Thank you. We'll do that in a few minutes. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. Why don't you talk to us now about the options for the uh, sidewalk? <clears throat> Good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Um, Jamie did a great job, but just to put a fine point on what she said, um, the only option for that sidewalk to be 
uh, constructed, uh, NCDOT will not maintain it and the county will not maintain it. Um, the applicant would have to seek a private agreement with the property owners uh, to maintain the sidewalk. So the, the proper is contingent on that. And because the, this, the existing current owner has expressed her, her unwillingness and lack of interest in that, there's a concern about the, this proper being implemented. So I just want to be really Understand. clear. Thank you very much. I, I think that came through, but I wanted to be pointed on it. Thank you. Okay. So then, in other words, the options that exist would be, you, what you've just outlined, Pat, then is the option that exists, which is that there would be a private agreement between the developer and the, and the property owners that there would be an agreement that the property owners would maintain this sidewalk. That's right. That, that's the only party that has a, a legal ability to, to do that. The, there's no annexation being proposed for those adjacent sites. So, um, in effect, then, I assume that that proffer is not effective at this point. It, it's the way I'd say it is. It's contingent on the that agreement being reached with the with the adjacent property owners. Is that something? Is that a kind of contingent proffer that we are familiar with and can take? Yes. And, and that's why Ms. Suniak asked that the applicant read the detailed language that they sent us today that makes that contingency clear. Is the um, contingency, it, it, the, the, the burden then, I would assume, would fall to the developer to do this, make the contact with the private property owners? It would. So what, what we've asked for, um, and I believe they're prepared to proffer, that'll be up to the applicant, of course, is that there would be some kind of offer of just, just compensation to, to do this. It wouldn't just be a request. I see. Um, but the they owner, of course, still could um, then not refuse that, and then the sidewalk would not get built at this time. I understand. Thank you. Sure, that was very helpful. Sure. Pat? Yeah. The, uh, the sidewalk, is, is there an option to construct a sidewalk on public property if someone would accept it, or is there not... Uh, space enough to construct that sidewalk. So that, that's a very good question, and, and it's not clear. There's a possibility this the sidewalk may be able to fit an existing right of way. Um, there's a this is a, what's called ribbon paving. There's not curb at this location. It would have to be behind an adjacent ditch for safety purposes. Uh, if you've been past this site, the adjacent credit union site has got that style of construction. Uh, and so, to answer your question, Mr. Manager, um, part of this would be um, obtaining the rights po possibly to use uh, the uh, adjoiner's private property to put the sidewalk in and get it, and therefore get an, a, a, an access easement as well as a maintenance agreement. And this is a sidewalk, the, the developer could construct a portion of sidewalk on their property on Highway 98? So the, ap the, ap the, the applicant will be required to build a portion of the uh, sidewalk on their property. And then going the back to the, the east from there? Right, so going back, about. well, so I, this is actually to the west, I think, what, what's under, to, towards the shopping center is what's being Excuse me, right, subject to the, west, of the yes. proffer. Uh, and that's where they would either need to uh, work with DOT to put it in their right of way and get the adjoining property owner to maintain it or actually acquire the rights to the property from the property owner and have them maintain it. Those are the options. Are you aware of any um, um, plans or potential development on that uh, adjacent property back to the west between there and the shopping center? There, there's one segment that the applicant referred to, the Goodwill property that it is under site plan and will have to build the sidewalk, but there's another 300 approximate foot. I believe it's a single family residence, and there's no imminent plans for that to be redeveloped or changed. I, I think over the medium <coughs> term, certainly that's likely, given the development pattern out there, but no, there's no plans. We've not had uh, situations in the past where developers made a contribution to the uh, city sidewalk fund in lieu of building a sidewalk, and uh, could that be an option in this case so that uh, when and if that property is finished and developed, that the, that money could be used uh, toward that completion? Yes, that's an option. It, it couldn't be constructed and maintained in that location until such time it was as annexed, but yes, the, the, your idea is, is legal and possible. It has been done previously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager, for those questions. Um, and thank you, Councilmember Caballero, for pointing out the price point, which was a question I had as well. Um, so um, let's, why don't we do this then, um, Mr. Sivers, why don't you 
uh, make, make explicit the proffers and uh, let's have our staff uh, let you know whether or not they work for, work for us, okay? Okay, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Again, Tim Sivers, Horvath Associates. Um, so I'll start with the sidewalk since that's the hot topic. Uh, the developer shall construct a five foot wide sidewalk along the frontage of 5218 and 5210 Wake Forest Highway west of the project frontage for approximately 305 linear feet to, to connect with the approved site plan D1600042 if either of the following options are accepted by the property owners, City of Durham, NCDOT prior to the site plan. Option one, additional right of way is not needed for the construction of the sidewalk and property owners adjacent to the sidewalk will provide maintenance and liability, which we discussed is currently not an option because of the existing homeowner. Option two, additional right of way is not needed for the construction of the sidewalk and the right of way adjacent to 5218 and 5210 Wake Forest Highway are annexed into the city limits at no cost to the developer. And tonight, uh, staff, I would also like to add in there a third option, as the city manager mentioned, that we would be able to, or we would commit to adding an option for the payment in lieu of that 305 feet so it can be developed in the future if needed. Thank you. Um, let's, let's wait and, and get the other uh, proffers in a minute. Let's go ahead and discuss that one if you don't mind. That's fine. So uh, the, there, I assume that the payment in lieu would need to carry some sort of dollar figure or a formula with it. Uh, can we uh, hear from staff on that? Good evening, Pat Young again with the Planning Department. So that's set at $65 a linear foot for the 305 feet. And that uh, that's the prevailing rate and is in the current city code. So the applicant could proffer a different amount, but that's that's the standard amount. $65 per linear foot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and for the record, it, it is flat out there. So it, okay. it is commensurate roughly. Thank you. Mr. Sivers? Yes, sir. Uh, can you uh, refine your proffer to proffer the uh, the sidewalk uh, in lieu payment at that rate? Yes, sir. Do I need to state that yeah, again? Yeah, that'd be I mean, good. I think okay. they like it when you do it, not when I do it. <laughs> uh, as a third option, we would, would be willing to proffer the payment in lieu at $65 a linear foot for the 305 linear feet of the adjacent sidewalk. Thank you very much. Okay. And Mr. Cybers, you want to go through your other proffers now to make sure that we're all on the same page? Yes, thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I might, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask the applicant to clarify, if I might, Mr. Mayor, um, sure. the way you phrased that commitment, it sounded like it was a option or choice of, of the applicant whether to choose option A, B, or C. I see. And uh, that that's a, doesn't seem to express the intent of the conversations having there you have the right to do that, but I wanted—I was hoping you would clarify that. Yes, I apologize. That was not my uh, not my intent. We will we will do we will do one of those three options, and it looks like it's likely as the payment of the. Does that clarify? It's at the city's discretion. Correct. It's at the city's at discretion. The city's discretion. Okay, that's a clarification that's helpful. Yeah. Yes. Thank that you. That is fine. Thank you, Mr. Sivers. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And uh, how about uh, your other proffers? Okay, uh, the second proffer was mentioned that was we would provide a 25 foot wide natural area along the southern boundary limits as indicated on sheet D100. And I will provide that updated uh, plan sheet to the planning staff. Uh, number three, a minimum of 15% tree save area will be provided. Number four, prior to issuance of a certificate of, certificate of occupancy, provide a one-time $500 contribution to the Durham Public Schools for each additional student estimate to be added by this development. Um, number five and last one, prior to issuance as a, of a certif certificate of occupancy, provide a one-time $8,000 donation to the City of Durham dedicated housing fund or a local affordable housing developer to assist with the development of affordable housing here in Durham. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, just to for clarification, I've, we're on the same page here. There are three students at it. Is that correct, is your understanding? Sorry, what was that, sir? How many students is at, or will that be That is correct, yes. Three, three is that right? Yes. And so this will be a $1,500 proffer. That is correct. And um, when would that payment be made? 
uh, prior to certificate of occupancy. Okay. How about, uh, I'm just going to suggest that uh, you uh, proffer the, uh, the affordable housing money to the uh, city's dedicated housing fund, uh, then we can work with the nonprofits, and I think that would work best. How would you feel about that? That's fine, sir, yes. Right. And then um, Yeah, I think those are my only questions. Anybody else have any questions or comments at this point? Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I had a question for you about this development. I didn't. I looked through the uh, the materials. I didn't see anything about like a little um, play area. What do they call it? A uh, tot lot. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Is there a little play area intended for this development for the folks who live there? Yes, that's not shown on the development plan, sir, because it's actually a UDO requirement. So yes, it, it is a good thing. There, there will be um, not necessarily a tot lot, but the option is there for some sort of active play area. Could be a soccer field, it could be a playground, but there, there will be some sort of park area um, on this development. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I have, I'll just have a few comments to make and council members may have some others. First of all, Mr. Talley, I wanna thank you for coming out. Really appreciate it. And uh, your questions really helped me think about what my questions ought to be, and I know it did for my colleagues as well, so thank you. Let me just say a couple of things I think that uh, occur to me about this. I do think that this is a, a, a price point that we need to be building houses at in Durham. That there are a lot of people in Durham who are having a hard time affording a, a home to own at higher price points that we're seeing so often in Durham. And I think that for many people that this is uh, a good price point, and, one, and this, is a, this is a level of housing affordability that we need more of. And the density, on the density question, and I understand, uh, Mr. Talley, you're, where you're coming from on this, but uh, I do think that this is at the lower area of the, uh, what's on the site plan? Is it the development plan, site plan, development plan? Is it on the lower end of the permissible density here uh, with the rezoning and I don't, I, I think that one of the things in Durham that we're going to have to get used to is that we need more density. We are, we are either going to be building uh, houses or we're going to have the prices of housing in Durham is going to go through the roof and we're not going to have enough housing for people. So I think there is a limit to density. We want to be careful, but to me, I'll just say for myself that this, uh, that this development definitely does not go over that limit and I think is actually uh, at a pretty good density. Uh, in this, in this uh, situation. Um, so I think those are my only comments. Uh, any other, I, I do want to say one other thing. I appreciated Councilmember Freeman's initial remarks about uh, the, this corridor. And I know that this is your neighborhood uh, and whoever your new neighbors will be. I do, this is a, this is a busy corridor. And um, so um, I think my mic just went off. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. It's not on. Lean into your mic, sir. I've got... It's red. Yeah. I, I wear two mics, if you can believe that, because apparently I don't speak loud enough. So I, now I'll speak into my third. Um, the... I, I appreciate what Councilmember Freeman had to say about this quarter. There is a quarter study, as she mentioned, that's going on for 98. Uh, but that is a ways off. Uh, the results of it are a ways off. And I just want to say to our members of, uh, and, and it will only do a few things. It's not going to do the kind of small area planning that you refer to. So I just want to say to our members of uh, Joint City County Planning, of which I'm not a member, uh, that this might be something that you want to uh, take to Joint City County Planning. I'm not sure how high up the priority list it will get given the tremendous demands on the planning staff, uh, but I think that is probably the right venue to start introducing that as a, as a as, as some, some kind of planning that needs to occur. So thank you for that. Appreciated that. Appreciate you calling that out. All right, council members, any other comments or questions? Just uh, Please. Uh, I want to echo a thank you for mentioning that it should go through, or a kind of a process it could go through is through the joint city county planning. I'm also not a member, so it's up to you guys. I, I, I want to um, just point or just say to Mr. Talia, I, I do also I hear your 
concerns. And I really appreciate the way that a developer has tried to kind of meet you halfway on most of that. I hope you feel like that's been the case. And if you don't, that you'll continue to speak with them through the process, because it doesn't just stop here. And I want to say to Mr. Cybers, I appreciate you taking the initiative to actually create the tree safe area. I know we had the conversation about that. And then also thinking about the affordable housing. And even though it's not something that would happen on your site, being, being proactive about being engaged in what the city needs as a priority. And I also want to commend you as well on taking the initiative to do the $500 um, per student um, amount. I just want to say that this, this, this is like a turning point. So I, I've served on the Planning Commission for almost four years. And I know that, that the developers of our city or developers around the country are coming here to Durham. And we want to welcome them, but we want to be sure that the needs of Durham are met. And so I really want to thank you again for trying to meet those needs and to listening to our residents who are existing in the community as well. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? If not, I'm going to uh, let me ask. Let me ask one more time. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this matter? Anyone else that would like to speak on this matter? All righty. If not, then I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter's back before the council. Mr. Mayor, motion to adopt the ordinance and it's annexing uh, 5220 Wake Forest Highway. Second. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, They're back on. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Thank you. My mics are back on, I guess. Thank you. I buzz now. Uh, thank you very much. We have a motion from Councilmember Austin to adopt, uh, for motion one to adopt the ordinance annexing 5220 Wake Forest Highway. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7 0. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if I could just. Councilor Council Olson, would you like to make a second motion? Uh, I would, uh, but it appears that. Count, nope, nope, nope. Uh, motion to adopt a resolution amending the future right. land use map. Is there a second? second. All right. Councilmember Freeman, did you have a comment? No, I was just also going to say I want to also commend the Planning Commission for being as detailed and keeping an eye on these developments as they occur. Especially well, I agree. Thank you. Their comments are always extremely helpful. All right. We have a motion and a second. On motion two, any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Motion to adopt consistency statement. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Any discussion? If not, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7 0. Councilmember Ralston. <laughs> and a motion to adopt an ordinance amending, amending the Unified Development Ordinance. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the ordinance amending UDO. Is there any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes 7 0. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for being here on this item. Uh, for those of you all who came for this, neighbors uh, and, uh, and the applicant, we appreciate it. We're now going to move on to item 20, the street closing for Wren Road, and we'll hear the staff report on that. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. <clears throat> Ellis Road Residential LP proposes to close 896 linear feet of public right-of-way in order to conform with the approved site plan for Ellis Road Phase 2. This is case D1400380. <clears throat> the right-of-way is currently dedicated and a portion is, in, is improved. If the request is approved, the closed right-of-way will acreage will be added to the adjacent parcels both owned by Ellis Road Residential LP. 
Staff recommends that the council approve the permanent closing of 896 linear feet of this street. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. We have now heard the staff report, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. First of all, are there any questions by members of the council for staff? Any questions by council colleagues? If not, is there anyone that would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone in the public that would like to speak on this item? Anyone here who would like to speak on this item? All right, any other questions, council members? Just, just raising a general concern. Uh, anytime that we're closing a public street and turning it into private property, I don't know if there's any conveyance of like a fee or however, but um, just just trying to figure out if this okay, is. Well, maybe staff can answer that question for us. Okay. Is there any fee when the when this uh, conveyance occurs? Well, technically, the existing public right of way is going to be closed, but there will be a realigned road that will provide access, which will be a public road. Okay. So it's it's closing one. And, and realigning an, an, an alternative. That would be the difference, mm -hmm. it, because they're just realigning where the road would go. That's right. If you in the staff report, you'll see one of the attachments has the um, approved site plan that shows the road, the new road alignment. So it's a it's a procedural matter in order for the applicant to conform with the site plan that was approved. All right. Any more questions, Councilmember Freeman or others? All right. If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter's back before the council. Do we have a motion? Move to permanently close 896 linear, 896 linear feet. Easy for me to say. Feet of Wren Road. <laughs> Thank second. you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the order. Any more discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. Seven zero, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to item 21, consolidate item for NC54 storage. And we'll hear the staff report. Good evening, Jamie Sunyak again with the Planning Department. <clears throat> a request for a future land use map amendment and a zoning map change has been received for a 1.9 acre property located at 1003 East NC54. The FLOM amendment would change the current designation of office to commercial. The applicant requests to change the zoning of the site from residential suburban 20 to commercial general with a development plan with CGD. Key commitments on the development plan associated with this request include a self-storage facility limited to 120,000 square feet building, additional right-of-way for a future bicycle lane, constructing a bike uh, I'm sorry, constructing a bus pullout and shelter on the north side of NC54, offering a cross access easement to the property to the east, uh, building and parking envelopes, tree coverage locations, and project boundary buffers. The Planning Commission considered this request at their December 12, 2017 meeting and recommended approval of the request by a vote of eight to four. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Action on this item will require three separate motions and votes, one for the FLOM amendment, one for the consistency statement, and one for the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunyak. You have heard the report of staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions or comments by members of the council. All right, hearing none, uh, we will hear from members of the public. Uh, I have here six people who have signed up to speak on this item. Uh, all of them have said that they are proponents of this, uh, of this development. Um, are there any people who would like to speak as opponents of this development? Just want to make sure when I divvy up the time here, I'm being fair. Anyone who would like to speak as an opponent of this development? All right. There are six members of the six people who have signed up as proponents. 
Uh, Mr. Sivers, I'm going to give you all 15 minutes. Uh, you don't have to use it all, but you may use it all. Uh, and um, I'm going to, are you, uh, would you like to start, Mr. Sivers? Who would like to start? Ms. Schwedler, are you? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jamie will actually start the presentation. Thank you. Say again. Jamie Schwedler with Parker Poe on behalf of the applicant, and I'll begin and then turn it over to the remainder of the speakers. Okay. Ms. Schwedler, I don't see that you've signed up, so when you finish tonight, would you please do so? I can do that. Thank you very much. If I could just have a minute to get, I, had, I have a quick PowerPoint, if I could just have a minute before the clock starts to run. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Jamie Schwedler with Parker Poe, Adams, and Bernstein. Here on behalf of the applicant, I'm at uh, 301 Fayetteville Street in Raleigh. Um, thanks to Ms. Sunyak for going through that presentation. I'd like to just highlight several key um, offerings of this development um, and, and walk the council through where it's located just to cover any, any questions you might have. Um, as Ms. Sunyak stated, this is a, a adjacent to the Barbie Road retail site on the corner of 54 and uh, Barbie Road. We're also adjacent to the greens of Pine Glen, and this is a rezoning and a future land use map amendment. Here's a view of the existing site, and this is a view of the site in context as you move from east to west along Highway 54, um, taking a look at both the intersection, the Barbie Road retail site that was just approved um, by the council in the fall, uh, our site in the middle, and then the apartments there in the distance. Uh, towards the west. The key text commitments that uh, Ms. Soniak highlighted are the limit to the use to sell storage, the limit on the square foot uh, maximum. Um, we also are limiting the distinct architectural features and the uh, limited building elements in terms of stucco, brick, and stone. Uh, and this is done in a way to make the, uh, the use low intense and also compatible with the, with the neighbors. Um, the limit to self storage is one of the most limiting uh, uh, aspects to this uh, this offer because the traffic is so low here. Um, it limits to less than 40 trips per day. You didn't need a traffic improvement um, analysis, and uh, those commitments that you see there are, are approved by DOT and went through the staff. Um, I'd also like to highlight the cross-access commitment to the Barbie Road retail site. Uh, that provision specifically uh, was a result of going through Planning Commission uh, a second time and adjusting some of the traffic commitments so that we could have cross access to the Barbie Road retail uh, should the sites uh, determine a development plan that they can work together. Um, adjacent uses and neighborhood engagement. We, we spent a good amount of time reaching out to neighbors and looking at the adjacent uses and how we could be a good neighbor. In addition to the low traffic and low use intensity that self-storage uh, entails, we visited neighbors <coughs> across the street, we visited neighbors in the greens of Pine Glen, and we've been working with them since the required neighborhood community uh, meeting all the way through the process. In addition, we reached out to the individual renters in the P greens of Pine Glen in the buildings that were adjacent to the site. We contacted over 72 renters. We brought with us a bilingual uh, translator so that we could reach all of the members of that community, um, and we received overwhelming support. Many of them uh, had been aware of the project and of the process, but had no concerns and had chosen not to appear. Some of them will be here tonight um, to talk about uh, their favor of the project. Um, and then highlighting some of the, the Planning Commission's comments, again, they echo on that low impact. It makes good sense. It's a reasonable expansion of the commercial mode. The two concerns that were raised by the Planning Commission, I believe we've been able to, to address, and I'd like to highlight those for a second. The first was the height. There was a concern whether this height was really compatible with the adjacent uses. And we've prepared this cross-section that shows a potential building on the right that's on the Barbie Road retail site. That site was approved for a 50-foot height limitation. Um, our building in the center, which would not need the full 50 feet, and so we're willing to offer a proffer to limit us to 43 feet. And then the existing uh, two-story apartments on the left side of your screen at the Greens and Pike Glen. Because they have gabled roofs, those are actually 30 feet. And so if you take a look at the, the topographic um, layout as you go down 54, and you look at the approved heights from both the Barbie Road retail to our uh, proposed site and then down to the existing neighbors, it draws a nice line that ties in very well. And that, this section wasn't available for uh, the Planning Commission to review, and so we felt it important to show Council, how the grades work in that area and how 
our proposed height actually is very congruent and is a reasonable transition between the two sites. In addition, there was a concern Excuse about the- Ms. Schweidler? Yes. Uh, is that a proffer, the 43 feet? Yes, Mr. Mayor, it is. And could you just state it again, please? I could. Uh, we're willing to proffer a height limitation on any building on the site to be no higher than 43 feet. Um, and turning to the second concern that was raised by Planning Commission about the, the appropriateness of the expansion of the commercial node, this area in the center shows how this new commercial node that was approved for the Barbie Road retail site fits in with the much larger commercial nodes on either side along 54, and the very small um, expansion that uh, this change on the future land use map amendment from uh, office to commercial uh, would result. The Barbie Ray retail is the large red in the center there, and our site is the uh, rectangle um, pink area to the edge. As you can see, there's a lot of development that's already occurred in this corridor. It's bordered by 40 to the north, and so there simply isn't much room for it to expand. And for these reasons, the, both the future land use map and the rezoning are consistent with uh, UDO 3.4.7. The change is consistent with the intent and the goals uh, that are aligned in the staff report. It's also compatible with the existing land use pattern because it makes a small expansion of a commercial node in a low intense way and in a way that's respectful to the neighbors. And it provides an appropriate transition uh, between the commercial and medium density, both in terms of height and in terms of stepping down in intensity of use. And three, the change would not create substantial adverse impacts because uh, we're, again, having that low traffic impact. We reached out to the neighbors and have not heard uh, any concern that we're not able to address. And four, the site is just simply too small to make uh, comparable use in terms of, of office because it is so narrow. And it's much more suitable for this, this commercial use. Um, going on to the, uh, to the two other aspects, the nodal development and cross assets are both met by our text commitments, and you can see the policies cited there. Um, and finally, just to note the topography, you can see in this map how it slopes severely down from uh, 54 and Barbie down toward the greens of Pine Glen. There was a concern raised by council about stormwater, and we explained that not only will we have to meet, of course, all of the stormwater regulations by the city, uh, but that there is no existing stormwater problems on the greens of Pine Glen uh, parcel, and that there shouldn't be any uh, added by this development. You can see how kind of substantial that is and how significant that that cell tower is there in the distance. Um, that's at least twice as high as the, the buildings that we're proposing. Um, and so with that, I'd like to, to close and cede the rest of my time to the speakers tonight. Um, we'd, we'd urge your support in both uh, the approval of both the land use amendment and the rezoning, and that it's consistent with Durham's policies and provides a reasonable transition uh, between the commercial site and the existing neighboring uses. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have five other speakers listed here, and I'm gonna call your names, and if you could please just come and line up over here, and then I'll call you up individually. Uh, Frank Boone, Kenan Borden, Jr., Christy Mully, Jason Freed, and Danita Thompson. If you all could just come over here, that would be great, and we'll start with Mr. Boone. Hello, my name is Christy, and I'm the property manager. Um, Ms. The Ms. Excuse me, Glenn. what's your name? Christy. What's your last Molly. name? Christy Molly. Okay, so is Mr. Boone here? Mr. Boone, are you here? Mr. Boone, you're up first. I'm sorry. Unless you have a reason not to go first, go ahead and talk to us. Okay. Thank you. First of all, my name is Franklin Boone, and I reside at uh, 1303 Elmset Lane, which is approximately 2.4 miles from this property that they're proposing to build. I am in favor of the self-storage use. I feel that it will uh, benefit the existing homeowners in this area. And I also, uh, it will benefit new residents as the residential construction continues to grow in the immediate area. And I think the multi-story building use of uh, storage will be an attractive uh, building that will also provide a neighborhood service and it will create, will not create any road traffic. I have not yet seen any road traffic on any uh, storage units. Uh, I also would like to say that it, it will benefit as well as moving into the 
neighborhood areas. There, I, I have experienced my uh, in the past uh, where I needed a storage unit when I re relocated, and I uh, I had to go 30 miles to find a storage unit because the the high demand for storage units in that, in my area was so high. You know, uh, there was just not enough, and I, and I applaud to, to see new storage units coming to the area. And I like to say that I appreciate the ongoing efforts of uh, Stackhouse Properties to invest in also our affordable housing and uh, making things uh, making things prosperous uh, for for many uh, Durham residents. And I'd like to thank you, you guys for considering uh, this request. Thank you, Mr. Boone. Mm -hmm. We'll now hear from Kenan Borden. Mr. Mayor, Council, my name is Kenan Borden. I live at 5 Kimberly Drive here in Durham. Uh, I am also a uh, one of the owners and managers of the South Point Professional Center, which is at 249 East NC Highway 54. It's approximately a ninth of a mile down from this case you're considering. Uh, as a neighboring business owner, I support this project because self-storage proposed at this site is consistent with the scale of the commercial projects in this corridor and adjoining neighborhoods. In this immediate area, between Highway 55 and the South Point area, there have been rapid growth in new housing development. Self-storage in this immediate neighborhood will provide a low-impact use that, that, direct, that directly provides a needed service to these local residents. I also think a significant advantage of this proposed use is that it, it will have a very low impact, traffic impact burden while providing a quiet transition between the apartments and the corner parcel. As neighbors, we're happy to support this request and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Borden. Now we'll hear from Christy Mully. Um, I'm the property manager at the Green Supply Blend, and um, we feel that it would be great for the um, community because we have to refer our residents elsewhere um, for storage, so it's very close to us. Um, we're in favor of it. Um, it's adjacent to our property. It's low traffic, <clears throat> uh, low people traffic, and low car traffic, and we think it's a good fit for us and our neighbor um, as a positive working relationship with this developer. Um, we have also assessed the tree buffer that will remain and believe it will be adequate for maintaining the quality of life of our residents. Um, and I know there is a concern about the storm uh, water runoff and whether this new development would make existing problems worse. And currently we have no flooding on our property along Highway 54 adjacent to their site. Um, with new development, they will be um, required to treat the water and release it which will help during rain events, which better control the run water runoff. The property across um, the Highway 54 is higher, so stormwater is not an issue. And we just think it would be an immediate um, uh, neighbor to the property, and we do support it. Thank you, Ms. Molly. And now we'll hear from Jason Freed. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Jason Freed, and I live at 710 South Bend Drive, uh, Durham, North Carolina, 27713, uh, which is about two and a half miles west of the property. Um, I recently moved to Durham after uh, suffering through significant flooding in uh, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, lost my home there, and came here in uh, August of last year. Um, so far, it's been great. Me and my family are settling in fine, and everyone's um, liking it quite well. I live just south of the South Point Mall, um, which is growing pretty rapidly. There's a lot of residential development there. Um, many of my neighbors that I'm meeting are also transplants from other parts of the country, so a lot of people are coming to Durham and specifically that area. Um, for the location close to I-40, close to the mall, close to work, from personal experience, from what I've researched, there is a lack of self-storage in the area. If I want to find self-storage, I need to go all the way to Highway 55 or all the way down to Highway 64. Um, so there's nothing close to me right now that offers me self-storage options. Um, and therefore, I support this uh, project and what it would bring to the community. Uh, thank you for your consideration, and I hope you will support this request as well. Thank you, Mr. Freed. Sir, thank you for... Uh I hope I'm, I'm sorry to hear about what happened to you in Houston, but I'm glad you're here in Durham. Well, thank you, Durham. Thank you. You'll like it here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now, uh, Ms. Danita Thompson, is she here? Okay, she must have left. Okay, is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Um, we're going to have questions from the council members in a moment, but let me just ask, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item, either pro or con? Okay. Uh, now I'm going to ask if there, can, if there are questions or comments by members of the council. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Um, I'm not gonna hate when the um, in when the, in a crime drama when there's been a trial, the judge like does all the well, on the one hand and on the other hand before they give you the big ruling. Can't stand that. So um, I'm, I intend to vote for the rezoning tonight. I wanted to explain a little bit why. If this is the appropriate time to do that, Mr. Mayor. Please do. I thought that's where we were. Absolutely. Um, I, I did not come into this process um, predisposed to support this. Uh, despite the uh, very good meeting I had with Mr. Cybers um, about this project, uh, the reason is simple. I voted against the, uh, the expansion or the creation of the commercial node at this intersection uh, a little less than six months ago in September 2017. I didn't think it was appropriate to develop a commercial node so close to two other very intense commercial nodes uh, along a stretch of Highway 54 that is already under significant stress uh, from considerable residential development. Uh, having... Um, not prevailed um, in uh, in seeking to prevent that prior rezoning. Uh, this particular matter now is on a different footing. Um, I was very concerned about two aspects of it: the cross connection, um, which a number of the planning commissioners raised as a as a significant concern. Do appreciate uh, the proponent um, moving to make that commitment tonight. Uh, the other was the building height. And um, I, uh, I was mindful of one of the planning commissioners who talked about the two-story difference in the buildings. And um, I think the drawing that we saw, the rendering we saw tonight was very instructive. And I also appreciate the additional commitment made tonight of the 43-foot uh, limit and height on this new building. Um, and I think given those two changes and the fact that um, despite my meager efforts, the commercial node now exists and is under construction, um, the fact is uh, self-storage, although we've seen a rash of self-storage approvals in recent years uh, in Southern Durham, uh, I think it's also, we've also heard that, that these units are at capacity, that, there's, that it's very difficult to find availability. Um, and given the large residential growth in this particular part of our city, um, I think it makes sense to allow this type of use in this area, even though it intensifies a node that I will um, probably curse every time I drive through it for the next 50 years. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, with that, I'll, uh, I intend to support the measure tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I hope you won't be cursing me. Didn't I vote for that? <laughs> no comment, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, any, any other comments or questions at this point? Council Member Caballero. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for doing the outreach to the uh, renters. That was something that was very important to me. And um, likewise, the roof line uh, images are helpful for those of us who are not in the field. So thank you. Thank you. Comments or questions? Anyone else? I have a couple. Uh, one is, um, the um, just a question about the the uh, the outreach that you did. Do you typically have a, a bilingual outreach, Ms. Schwedler? No, we don't, Mr. Mayor. And in fact, we met with um, Council Member Caballero, and she um, explained that there's a lot of communities in Durham that have a have a high Spanish speaking population, and that we should consider in the future reaching out in in a different um, in a language or or something that they're comfortable with. We went back to the, the developer here actually owns several rental properties in the city and has a tenant representative that speaks Spanish. And so when we talked to the Greens of Pine Glen, she actually informed us that they, they do have a 30% Hispanic population. And um, so we sent them out to, uh, to join the developer in, in those outreach programs. And uh, we're glad we did. Bravo to you, Council Member Caballero, and to the developer. Thank you very much. Um, that's a, a welcome. Welcome addition to the outreach. Um, I think that 
yeah, uh, here's my other question. And I believe, I'm not sure which of the two of you all to take this, but what does it mean that the proffer for the cross connection, if the two development plans coincide, or what was that language? We, um, at the council meeting in September when the Barbie Road retail site was approved, uh, that was a, an offer, I believe, that was made at the table. And it was an offer for a cross-access easement uh, to our site and would be determined at the development plan stage. And so when we went back to the Planning Commission, we offered the same commitment. And when the two projects are at the development site uh, stage, we'll work to see whether and where a cross access could be located. Um, we don't know what their, their plans are at this time and where their buildings will be sited, and so we'll have to work together to make sure that, that something like that would be possible. So can I ask staff, do we like that proffer? Is that uh, the proffer that uh, makes sense? Yep. Uh, Bill Judge, Transportation, yeah, we're, we are, a, aware of the, the proffer on the other zoning um, case. No site plan has been submitted on that, so we haven't really established that location. But now that we have the proffer on, on both uh, development plans, we'll work towards getting that when the first site plans come in. Okay, thank you. And the language that they have, Mr. Judge or, or, or Mr. Young, is, is suitable? Uh, it's acceptable to transportation, and I believe it's acceptable to the planning department as well. Yep. Thank you very much. So all I'll say about that, Mr. Sivers and Ms. Schwedler, is that I'm sure that not just myself, but all of us will be exceedingly disappointed if that cross-connection is not made. And you'll be working with the other developers to make sure that happens. Okay. All right. Council members, any other questions or comments? Council member Reese. Just briefly, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to make two additional points, first of all. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Caballero for bringing that issue to the table. She shames us all. Um, it shouldn't take her effort to be asking these questions of developers, and I think I'll personally take it uh, as a lesson to myself to make sure to ask those questions in the future. The second thing, Mr. Mayor, is because you raised the issue about the previous vote, I wanted to say that, in my view, I failed my colleagues that night. Um, that was a vote. Uh, I should have explained my no vote. Uh, in advance of taking it. I think it would have uh, enlightened the conversation. Uh, I chose not to do it because I knew that most other, most of our other colleagues were intending to vote on it, vote for the measure. Uh, and uh, to be perfectly honest, um, in retrospect, I think that was probably one of my worst failings of the last uh, term of our, of our council is my failure to explain that particular vote. And I just wanted to let you know that um, to you and council member, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, that that's not going to happen again. Well, um, we usually are pretty familiar with you explaining yourself really, really well, Council Member. So I'm sure it won't happen again. That, that's why I said Nevertheless, that I, you have my permission to curse me every time you drive by Barbie Road. I think that will be something you'll enjoy for the rest of your life. No doubt, Mr. Mayor. All right. Any other comments, Council Members, or questions? Just a question regarding that, the graphic that was shown about the heights. Is that the actual grade that the water would flow down towards? Yes, ma'am. Tim Sivers, Horvath Associates. Yeah, the uh, the green line there is the uh, existing grade from the Barbie Road retail site on the right to the apartment complex on the left, yes. And so I just want to be really cautious. And I mean, I'm, I'm, it, I'm weighing really heavily on the no side in this conversation because of that. And <coughs> I don't want to be Charlie in, in a year. Sorry. Because of the existing grade? Yeah, well, here's my thing. So I, I heard from the property manager saying that they don't have any stormwater um, issues right now, or they don't have heavy rains where they have, they have flooding occurring. And I'm concerned that we would be creating a situation where they would. And I'm not for certain. So I know you heard, I heard you say to, to the city's requirements, but I know how undercut those city requirements have been in the last two years. And so my concern becomes, how, how do we make sure that the, the stormwater and the flooding potentials are alleviated to the maximum, not the minimum? Um, 
Understood. So the, uh, the map in front of you is the topography map, and unfortunately I can't see the cursor, but the long rectangle there right in the middle is our property area. You can see below that, that blue line, so that's the, uh, the ditch, if you will, uh, that falls um, to the southern portion of the, Pine Gr the um, apartment complex. Mm -hmm. That area you can see is not developed um, because that is the lower area. Uh, the picture on your right-hand side proves that very well. This is the two-story apartment buildings that are the cross section is through. On the right-hand side, you can see that low area. So the, these units as well are built up above to, to limit the potential. So this, this tree line that's there would stay there? Yes, this, what, what you're looking on the right-hand side is, is in a picture from the apartment complex looking towards our site. Mm -hmm. The cell tower is on the further side from our site. So mm -hmm. um, the area behind these buildings on the picture on the right is where our development will be. So the, the landscape buffers between the two units will, will remain. I need, I need city staff on, on this. I'm trying to just, the minimum change that was made um, in the last, uh, I think it was last year in a legislative session that reduced our ability to, to create um, really healthy stormwater requirements I want to know that this this fits in there comfortably because I, I mean I just don't I don't I'm not an expert in that area but I, I do recognize that there's been some changes that have prevented us from so um, not a hundred percent sure about which uh, stormwater requirements that you're doing but the the rules that are set in place currently for our stormwater requirements for quantity and quality control uh, would be present for this development. So quantity and quality. The quantity that they can take in like a heavy downpour, that would be a maximum of? So typically the reduction is to the two and 10 year storms. Okay. Uh, if there are substantial downstream uh, impediments or, or flooding that already occurs, which is taken into account in the evaluation of the stormwater impact analysis, uh, those requirements can go up to the 100 year. And, and that detains basically from post-development to pre-development. So it returns back to the, uh, essentially the uh, existing water. It captures the water and holds it, so it returns it back to its pre-development condition. Okay. does tend to elongate that path, but it reduces the flow. So what's the likelihood of that elongation causing flooding down towards the apartments. I know they sit up a little bit, but I have seen some flooding in. Yes, and, and that is taken into account uh, for that. So they look at that detention and they look at that hold back time uh, to determine what would minimize any impacts to the downstream properties. And that is standard for all developments. Thank you, Mr. Joyner. I think that's that's helpful. Um, the one thing I wanted to qual uh, or clarify is that this is the existing grade that you're seeing on on the screen, and so that will be altered. But you can see that the difference from where our proposed building would be to where the the uh, apartments are is probably like the most flat area there. Um, and in addition to the water quality and quantity rules that Mr. Joyner went over, which are um, also the incorporation of the state rules into, into the code. I don't believe the, the legislation that, that is altering that has been passed yet. We can talk about that, at, I guess, offline. Um, but the other system of protection that the city has is that the stormwater ponds are inspected on an annual basis by people that are certified um, to install them. And there's mechanisms in place that if they're failing, the city has an, a, an ability to go back and, and make sure that those repairs are being done in the way that they should be. So um, if there were to be some sort of uh, flooding event and the, and the stormwater uh, control feature was malfunctioning or, or something, I do believe the city would have the, the ability to, to help make sure that that was set right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I think that, uh, again, Councilmember Freeman is raising a really important point about our stormwater. And, um, and we are concerned about the new state rules. I don't think that we can, I mean, I, we have to really count on our, uh, our city stormwater 
folks and uh, the future inspections of these ponds and so forth because we know we, we can't always just stop any development that's uphill from other development. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that we can't have a general rule like that or, you know, we, 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 didn't, we wouldn't want to have a general rule like that. So, but I appreciate your questions because I think that we all are concerned with storm water and uh, we have seen, uh, we have seen what it can be like when it goes bad. And, and to that end, I just want to suggest to uh, our, our stormwater folks, and I guess Robert, you're the only, only one here today, is that at some point, we had a fantastic tour last year of some of our stormwater treatments Amazing. for several council members, and I think uh, Council Member Reese was on it, and maybe Amazing. Council Member Johnson was on it too, I'm not sure, Amazing. but it was a fantastic tour, and I would suggest you might want to do the same, arrange the department to do the same for some of our new members. That's my thought. Absolutely, sir. Thank I'd you. love to do it again. It was awesome. Okay, enough of that. Uh, and now um, we're going to, uh, any more questions by council members? Anyone else want to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to declare this matter, this public hearing closed. The matter is back for the council. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the change to the future land, loose, land use map. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7 0. Madam Mayor, please. I'll move we adopt the consistency statement. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We adopt the consistency statement. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Close the vote. <coughs> Motion passes 7 0. I'll move we adopt the um, ordinance amending the UDO. Thank you. Is it second? Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Is there any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Motion passes 6-1 with Councilmember Freeman voting no. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Now we're going to move back to, we pulled an item for the general business agenda, which was, I believe, item 16. And Council Member Middleton <coughs> hey, uh, pulled this item, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I promise this is very quick. Uh, Danny, we had some conversation at the work session uh, around 4B, Clause 4B of the agreement, um, regarding pre-existing duct work to kind of limit tearing up our streets. It, if we adopt this tonight, and I, w what is the mechanism and timetable of determining if those ducks exist? And w what's the timetable and mechanism of that, determining the, those ducks existing and moving forward? I know they don't have to, the owner doesn't have to accept the offer from the, the, the developer, but how does that work if we adopt this tonight? Uh, yeah, hi, Dan Valero from Public Works. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, right now, our our only ability is to reference our the inventory uh, data inventory we have available in our GIS systems. So, when we get a permit, we would look at that point uh, at what is available, what's nearby in the GIS system. If there are available ducts, we would ask, can they be used, uh, and then we would expect an answer before issuing the permit. Uh, if yes or if no, why why not? Why can they not be used? Mm -hmm. uh, I remember we had the conversation about policing, and you know I, I wasn't going to be a policeman, but uh, we we don't really have the ability to f determine the suitability of an existing duck. That sure. would be a lot of manpower. Um, so we are the, the historically we've taken the applicant's word for the reasoning why they can or can't use the existing duck work. And as I understand it, that decision may have already been made by those companies. When they, when they scope a project this big, they do figure out what existing duct work is available, and they uh, determine <clears throat> the suitability of each duct and the uh, financial, uh, uh, if it makes sense financially to, to use that duct work. So that, those conversations have likely already occurred, but we certainly will become aware of them for each permit application and, and get an answer at that point. That makes sense. My, my, my sense was the representative from Spirit at the work session did not seem aware whether or not there was a, maybe he wasn't the right person in the project, but I, I didn't get the sense that they were aware of whether there were pre-existing ducks one way or another, but 
Yeah. I appreciate your certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. Someone in the organization is, and we we'll, and we can tackle that on a permit by permit basis. Got you. Thanks so much for your work. That's it. No problem. Thanks, Thank you very much, Council Member. Thank you, Daniel. All right. Uh, any more discussion on this item? Just uh, another appreciation. Um, I just want to share that the Spirit Communications was uh, willing to come forward and share their workforce statistics with us. And um, I had a great conversation with uh, one of their staff members about the diversity that they're working towards as a small business. And I really uh, appreciated them being forthcoming with that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve this item. Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and then second that we approve this item. Any more discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote for item 16? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Is there any other, any other business to come before this body? If not, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 9.04. Thank you.